Yesterday, you were quietly and not so quietly bombarded by thousands of marketing messages desperately vying for your attention. On your Facebook, along the roadside, in the train, inside the lift, on TV, on a podcast, there is no escape. As a consumer, you'd love nothing more than for them to disappear. However, as a business owner, you want your messages to stand out and stick to encourage prospects to take action, right? Well, according to today's guest, the solution comes in the form of a block. It's a standout episode 497 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Podcast. Well, I said, welcome to the Small Business Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. Welcome back to your weekly dose of standout marketing. I'm your host, Tim Bo Reed. You are... Infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. And if that's not enough and you're itching to fast track your marketing, then let's get personal Hmm. with a one-on-one coaching session, which you can book over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Big episode today. Jamie Mustard the author of a new book called The Iconist joins us to share how blocks are the solution to your business getting noticed by the right people at the right time. Plus, I'll let you in on next week's guests whose small business is threatening at least one of the major banks in Australia. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Before getting stuck in, a couple of things. Good news, bad news. I'll start with the bad news. There is no monster prize draw this week. (laughs) I know. Like, why? Because I have no entries. Extraordinary. I give away over $1,000 worth of prizes every week to a guest who shares one idea they've learned from this show, implemented, and just tells me what impact it's had on their business. Just email me, tim at timreid, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U, and if I read you out on air, you win. It's that easy. The good news. The good news is episode 500 is coming up in, what have we got? Three episodes time. And I am turning it over to you, the precious listener. I've had many listeners, many of you suggest that why don't I just take questions from you guys and kind of let you inside. You might want to know a bit more about, you know, how I got to do this show. You might have a marketing question for your business. (laughs) You might have a constructive criticism for a little bloke with a thick skin like me. So email me, tim at timreid, reid.com.au, send in your question And no matter how many I get, I will answer them all on episode 500, which is coming up, as I said, in three weeks' time. All right, let's meet today's guest. Now, getting a message seen and heard in this constantly connected world is pretty tough, right? Getting people to actually take action, well, that's even tougher. No doubt you're in the process of trying all sorts of things in your business because you listen to this show. You might be trying to inject brand personality into that wonderful brand that you are building. You might be telling compelling stories that get prospects wanting more or running radio ads at high frequency or creating incredibly helpful content. I hope you're doing that. That helps your customers make a more informed purchase decision. Well, if you're doing any of that, keep it up if it's working. But there is another way of standing out and getting noticed in this very, very crowded marketplace, and it involves creating blocks and icons. Now, to explain how you can benefit from this thinking in your business, and you can, I promise, I caught up with the author of a new book titled The Iconist, in which he explains the art and science of standing out. His name is is Jamie Mustard. I started off by asking Jamie to remind us of just how big the problem is that us business owners are facing in the battle for attention. Well, okay, you have to say it like this. Anything, anybody that leads with the busy in the current world of digital media and mass messaging overload 
gets instantly discarded. And the reason that is, is because we're all being diluted by mass advertising. If you were a baker in a small town in Australia, uh, you would have, or, you know, say in Melbourne, Australia, uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, you would have been competing with a few other bakers, 10 other bakers. Today, everything competes with everything. There are estimates that say that when you walked around your daily life in 1950, you would probably be exposed to about 250 advertising messages a day. Hmm. By 1970, that was 2000. By the late 90s, last time somebody kind of officially tried to study this, it was up to five to 7,000. That's before social media, when the internet was just getting going. So you can probably estimate that you're being hit with about 10 to 15,000 advertising messages a day, conservatively, which means scarcity of attention is the defining business challenge of our time. The hardest problem, the biggest problem that anybody that is listening to this podcast is facing is getting the attention of the people who they know in their heart, if they just understood their product, understood their service, would want them. But those people are so distracted by mass messaging, and I can give you more statistics on that, that everything competes with everything and your voice is being diluted. Jamie, I'll tell you why. Because okay. as my, my listening audience are small to medium business owners and they're all actively trying to get attention. They're running their Facebook ads. They're running their local newspaper ads. They've got their, you know, branding, they get their, their cars skinned with their logo in whatever way they're trying to get attention. But I think it's so interesting to understand the bigger context of just how crazy and busy the world is with marketing messages. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you another example of what I'm talking about, where my book kind of takes a left turn. There's a lot of books that are talking about what the internet is doing to us, and, there, and some of them are very good. There's a great book by Nick Carr called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains About Shorter Attention Spans. The way I look at it is there was a woman in the late 90s who was doing research for Microsoft and Apple named Linda Stone. And in 1998, she coined the term continuous partial attention to describe how we were being bombarded with so much content, we were only partially paying attention because we're, we're being distracted by so much messaging. Again, we're only partially paying attention. When mm. most people talk about this issue, they think about it in terms of themselves. I'm distracted. I'm trapped by my phone. What I'm interested in is if everyone around you is distracted, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your business, your ability to get traction where you knew if people truly took a moment to understand you with their shorter attention spans, that you would be their first choice? Okay, so they're not giving you a chance and you're being made invisible. And there's actual psychological repercussions that come from that. And if you want, I can continue to talk about that or we can, you know. No, absolutely. Like what are those psychological repercussions of what do you call it being over messaged? Yeah, over message. In my book, I call it dilution, which is, mm -hmm. you know, again, if you were competing with, if you were baking cakes in your town 70 years ago, you were competing with a few other bakers, they would, and you could competitively grab attention every time. Now, with mass messaging overload, you couldn't process a thousand messages a day, let alone the 10 to 15,000 you're hit with. And it's kind of like I give this example in the book of, say, Tim, I threw a golf ball at you. You would catch it. Yeah. Okay. What would happen if I threw 10,000 golf balls at you all at the same time? You would turn, you would cower, you would duck away. This is the climate that we're trying to get people's attention in. Account, they're so overwhelmed, they're barely looking at you. So my book uh, is Primal Laws that allow you to grab attention every time at will and with deliberation and to bypass how numb people have got, how overwhelmed people have done. You can go kind of straight into the lizard brain and grab their attention. So when the founder of Fast Company, the co-founder of Fast Company endorsed my book, he said, scarcity of attention is the defining business challenge of our time. Mm. And I, that's the biggest problem I run into. I'm running into that as an author. And even with even knowing my own techniques, I'm able, I've been able to overcome it very well because I apply what's in my book to my own career and life. But so to talk about these psychological implications, there's a book that came out in 2004 by Barry Schwartz called The, the Paradox of Choice. And he talks about how Barry Schwartz is a professor of social theory at Skidmore University and a psychologist. 
And he talks about how choice overload affects what people will purchase. He recites some studies and it affects, and it, and it actually has psychological implications on the person uh, trying to make a choice. So if I go to look at a company and there's 10 different options or there's too many different options, I feel anxiety about making the wrong choice. I may not choose any at all because, so I'll be paralyzed because I'm afraid to make the bad choice, so I'll be paralyzed. Choice is to not make a choice. My, your choice is not to make a choice because you don't want to make the wrong choice. Then when right. you do make a choice, you knew there were nine or 10 or 100 other things that you could have chosen from, so you're dissatisfied with your choice because you're thinking about what else you could have got. Yes. And yes. then lastly, choice overload, having too many choices and not knowing which choices to make can actually cause depression. And so what I found is that those same psychological manifestations apply to when we feel like we cannot grab attention. Because what I found when small and medium business owners and even the big CEOs that I work with, when I first started doing this, Tim, all I was trying to do was solve a, a problem with a kind of Gladwellian social science. I wasn't thinking that I was coming up with some sort of element of social change, mm. but I found that there was a massive psychological effect on my clients before we even started deploying the work, just from defining the work. Because when you run a small business or even a medium-sized business, for the person running that business, it's not just a business, it's their life. It's their kid's mortgage, or it's their mortgage. It's their kid's college tuition, right? So they define a lot of who they are through that business. So when people were able to communicate and get the attention of using the primal laws in my book of their potential customers at will, that it changed their face. It changed their whole, they would become almost different people. So back to kind of the negative psychological effects of feeling like you're not going to be able to get attention. Well, if I feel like I'm not going to be able to get attention, Tim, I may not try to get attention. Again, it's the exact same psychological consequences that Barry Schwartz assigned to choice overload are assigned to when we feel deluded and we're not going to be able to get attention. If I feel like I can't get attention, I might not, I won't even try. You're listening to the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show, and we're chatting with Jamie Mustard, who's the author of a fantastic new book called The Iconist, all about the art and science of standing out. I just want to pause you there and just kind of drive home a couple of points you make here, because you know, right now we are setting up a problem. Fortunately, we have a solution that you have completely detailed in your book, The Iconist. I absolutely love, and we're going to get to that solution in a moment, guys. But just, I just want to drive home this choice thing because I see far too many businesses try to offer far too many things, whether it be products or services or, or offers or specials or whatever it is, hoping that enough of them will appeal to enough people. We had Seth Godin on the show a couple of weeks ago and he talked about all you need is a thousand people who absolutely love you. Most small businesses just need a thousand people to give you a hundred bucks each. You know, it's that type of thing. Stop trying to be everything to everyone. You talk and you give a great right. example in the book, which was a study done uh, elsewhere of the jams. And I just want you to drive home this point to why choice and offering so many options to our prospects is not necessarily a good thing. Could you do that? Uh, yeah, I could. And, and that, that jam study has been cited. I'm not the first person to cite it. Malcolm Gladwell touches upon it in Blink. And uh, Perry Schwartz talks about it in his book. But I kind of go into it maybe in a more, in a different way, maybe in a more detailed way from my point of view of dilution. But what they found was there was a study done by Columbia University. What they found was that they did a social experiment where they sold jam in a supermarket. And they offered 25 flavors of jam and they stacked up the jam really high and more people stopped to buy jam. Very few people bought the jam. So then they reduced the number of jams that they offered to see what the reaction in the supermarket would be. And they had maybe four to six jams. Now it was a very interesting thing. A few less people stopped to look at the jam because there was less of it, but the purchasing of the jam went up by something like 35%. I could have the number wrong. And it, or it could have been more, but it went up by a staggering number. Significant so, amount. Yeah, a very, very, a staggering number, a life changing number, a viability of your business number. Mm -hmm. And so 
the, the point that you're defining there is kind of what something that I said at, at the top of the conversation, Tim, which is anything that somebody can't understand instantly when they go on your landing page or when they see any sort of your sales material, any point of con- customer contact, if they can't understand who you are and what they, what you do before they have a chance to think, you get instantly discarded. Hmm. Anything that anybody that's leading with anything busy gets instantly discarded because of choice overload, and you may be losing that customer forever. I open the book with that statement, actually, in the introduction. You do. Yeah. Let's give an example where so much choice is removed, but the overload of messaging is removed, Jamie. And the city of, say, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Sao Paulo? Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, yeah. Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's a great case study here where the mayor or the council decided to remove all signage. Explain that one and how that impacted. Well, Sao Paulo was a city, and this was just in the 2000s. This is very recent. This isn't something that happened forever ago. Sao Paulo is a city that has a lot of pollution, and it has it had a staggering amount of signage, like the way that Hong Kong has signage, you know? Mm-hmm. What they they did is that because Sao Paulo had all sorts of noise pollution problems and car pollution problems. They decided to start confronting the pollution of the city and they decided they would start with visual pollution. So what they did is, is they banned all outdoor advertising in a city, a massive city, the second largest city in all of Brazil. So like New York, they banned all outdoor advertising and it was stripped away, leaving just the architecture of the buildings. And the people that live in Sao Paulo, I mean, this was an initiative by the mayor and, and, uh, uh, but the people that lived in Sao Paulo Paulo just said it was transformative Mm. just to not be constantly assaulted by imagery and distracted all the time by these images. And that it kind of revealed the lost architecture of the city. And it even, there was even slums, which they call favelas that were being hidden by all of this advertising and it, it kind of forced the city to look at its problems. So it, it actually created kind of a visual fresh air where people could kind of experience what was in front of their face. And you could say, we were all living in a world like that relatively in 1950. You know, and it appears obvious, you know, you remove all the clutter and I, I want to bring that back to like a, a business learning, but if you remove the clutter and just leave the really important messaging and the really important messaging, as long as you've got your messaging right, it's going to stick and it's going to have some impact on someone who could potentially buy from you. Now, Jamie, I think we've done a fairly good job of setting the scene of the problem that we live in as business owners, and that is to get the attention of people who want to buy from us. Fortunately, you've come up with a solution, and I'm going to get you to explain the concept of blocks and icons, which is the way you way you talk about this solution, and the psychology that explains how deceptively simple this theory is. Yeah, there's a way that we are hardwired as human beings uh, to take in information, and the best way to describe it is kind of how we feed information, how we teach and give information to small children and babies. I use the word block to describe something that magnetizes our attention. And we, when we repeat it, it becomes iconic in the mind. It's actually a rule of how we take in information that George Orwell detailed very aggressively in his kind of dystopian novel, 1984, his dystopian nightmare. He's basically saying this way of communication is nefarious. And what I'm arguing is this is the we commu- way, way we communicate to small children in elementary school learning, um, and it's not inherently nefarious. It's actually how we as human beings prefer to take in information. That's why it's so effective. So if you understand that it's just a mechanism of per- per- perception, you can use it for good, and we use it for good every day in millions of elementary schools all over the world. So I just use the word block to describe what happens when you put a small uh, a toy block in front of a baby. It's a massive thing to a baby with an intricacy inside of it. And anything that has a kind of massive oversized shape that has some intricacy connected to it, that the two opposites of that uh, magnetize attention in any field, whether it's a painting, whether it's music, 
whether it's an advertisement, whether it's a speech, whether it's an email to your boss, whether it's to a customer, whether it's to get buy-in from your colleagues, you can use this talk, this concept of a block to grab attention. But kind of let me back up and kind of give a simple, a simple example. If you look at, say, elementary school books, we use large pictures and imagery with the information. There's been research, which I detail in the book, uh, a lot of science that explain, that, uh, has proven that our visual acuity, our visual learning is a lot bigger than our conceptual learning, mm -hmm. um, or our written learning. So if there's a big visual anchor that, or a big obvious concept that we could instantly understand, which I call a block, um, connected to some more complex information, it instantly removes the clutter around it, like a road sign or a warning label, and it locks attention. It's kind of like the count, you know, one, two, three on Sesame Street. So a block, when you repeat it, all a block is is an icon waiting to happen. So when we think about something that's iconic, like why we call a Kleenex a Kleenex or a Coke a Coke, we think that that happens by luck, chance, or years. But in reality, when you understand the anatomy of what makes something iconic, you can make that happen in five minutes with any targeted audience, with deliberation and intention and at will perfectly every time. I really like the definition. You give a very simple definition. And, and, and whilst it's a simple concept, it does take a little while to sink in. The definition you give of a block in your book is a block is a succinct statement, phrase, image, or design that can be understood instantly. Now, in order for this penny or block to drop, Jamie, for our listeners, let's go through some examples of speeches, of music, of visual arts, architecture, and then we'll get into marketing of blocks. I think you're right. And I think uh, that's a, perfect. And typically when I do talks, Tim, I, I'll i start with the visual. But because we're <laughs> being listened to, <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. start with the verbal. Give us an example of a okay. block in a speech. Okay. So I grew up in uh, Los Angeles and partly in Los Angeles and Oregon. But I went to university in London. And one of the things that struck me when I was in London is the, uh, is the ubiquity of the American, I have a dream speech, which I thought was kind of an American phenomenon, but it's actually the most famous speech in all of human history. People from all over the world, whether at my university, which is very international, whether they were from the Middle East or Malaysia or Japan or China, everyone knows this speech by Martin Luther King. And it literally is the most famous speech in human history. And it's because he used blocks. The speech is relatively short. It's 1600, a little over 1600 words where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. uses the words, I have a dream or let freedom ring approximately every 85 words. And the only reason that it is the most famous speech in human history beyond obviously the message it carries is powerful. So it's a combination mm -hmm. of the message, but the only reason it there was access to that message and it became the most successful speech in human history was because of blocks. The repetitive phrase that's emotional that you could instantly understand ties you into the complex sentiment of the speech. It carries with it the emotion of the speech, the content of the speech, all of it. If you take those words out, nobody, those blocks, those simple phrases that you can understand instantly that are repeated, Nobody knows that speech, and it's just one of many speeches that Martin Luther King gave. But a couple of decades plus later, Winston Churchill, June 4th, 1940, went on the BBC to galvanize British support for the war. Uh, they were battered. The British people were losing faith. And he gave what is now known as his We Shall Fight speech, it, and he, where he repeats the words, We Shall Fight, his block, like I have a dream, over and over and over again. It's his closer. And he says, We Shall Fight. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight. And that speech galvanized support for the war and brought the British people together to stay the course. So blocks can do far more than carry complex information and bring people into your offering. When you understand how a block works, it can motivate people to do extraordinary things. Blocks also carry complex information with them. So but all a block really is, is this simple statement you can, that you can instantly understand or image or sound, melody, right? That 
before you have a chance to think. We'll talk in this interview about how to craft one of these things. And I can repeat it to you, Tim. Uh, and I could in five minutes take something that you've never heard before and make it have the same significance in your mind as a McDonald's logo by just repeating this repetitive thing that you could instantly understand. I didn't call it a block, but I've been doing this show for 11 years. And for most of those years, I start, I welcome my listeners back using a couple of paragraphs that remain unchanged for years. And every now and then I get an email from a listener saying, why do you always start the show in the same way? But now I know, I mean, I can now sort of, you know, I can retrofit your theory and say, well, it's a block. It's a hook that has sort of become in my tiny little niche, an iconic way in which I start this show. And I know the majority of people look forward to it and it anchors them and they know exactly where they are and it makes them feel good. Uh, I love delivering it and that's a block, I guess. Isn't one of the things that you say it's the biggest or the largest, most successful small business podcast? It, it won uh, the Australian Podcast Awards a couple of years ago. So I always say it's the award-winning small business big marketing show. But I, there's little things that I say is like, as per usual team, there's marketing gold dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing <laughs> HQ. So let's get stuck right in. And, and okay. you know, just little things like that. Um, I dig well, I don't digress, but I'm just trying to, again, bring it back into small business world. Let's talk about blocks in music, Jamie. You, you, in your book, you reference nursery rhymes, you reference Beethoven. No, but when, when somebody takes something in their mind that you're repeating this thing to, it's now no longer, longer a block. It's now an icon. So once uh -huh. something is, a, a block is just an icon waiting to happen. I just want to make sure that I communicate. Yeah, and then nice. once it's taken into the mind of your audience, uh, you it becomes still a block, but it it's, it's also now an icon. So that's, the, that's the, dif the difference between the two. Once it's taken on, the block is an icon. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yeah. Music. Okay, music. So in, a, a block in music is a repetitive, dominant, nursery rhyme type melody over a more complex arrangement. And like the I Have a Dream speech or the Winston Churchill speech, it allows us to access the more complex information. So if you look at Beethoven's Ode to Joy, da, 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 right? It's the reason that song or that composition lasts almost four centuries. It, it's the access point into the more complex arrangement. If you flash forward three, four hundred years, it's the reason why Michael Jackson's Mama Say, Mama Samu Makusa, Mama Say, Mama Samu Makusa is so addictive. And that's why in pop music, they call it the hook because it grabs you, pulls you in, and it doesn't give you a chance. So a, a simple nursery rhyme type melody that you could instantly understand that brings you into a more complex arrangement, that's a block in music. Yeah, got it. Okay, hopefully the penny's starting to drop, listeners, because again, why is it blocks important? Because there are so many messages out there and I want your messages in your business to stand out to the right people. And, and as Jamie said, we will go through a process of how you can create your own blocks in your business. Um, in the visual arts, Jamie, you reference um, Andy Warhol, you reference uh, Van Gogh as artists who unknowingly maybe created blocks and as a result got noticed. Give examples there. Again, this is, there's, these are other examples from the book. But if w what I say is that if you look at the, the two most known artists internationally in terms of our collective consciousness. And if, so if I walked up to a person in a working class neighborhood in Sydney that didn't know anything about art and I, and I showed them a, a Van Gogh or a Warhol, they would recognize it. They might not recognize a Picasso, but almost anyone anywhere in the world would recognize a Van Gogh or a Warhol. And that's because they use blocks in almost all their major works. So with Warhol, a soup can, a Maryland face, a Mao, you can, you can instantly understand that it's an image that takes up the entirety of the square or the rectangle that you can instantly understand before you have to uh, have a chance to think. And then it brings you into the technique. Interesting here, Jamie, is that both Warhol and Van Gogh had other styles you know they were doing other forms of painting right they landed on a particular style 
which became their block, it got them noticed and then became iconic. And so when we think about Warhol or we think about Van Gogh, that particular style of the soup can, you know, using Warhol as an example, is what we immediately go to. I, I know, Tim, that you used to be in the advertising industry, right? I did. So I, uh, you probably know that Warhol used to be a, a realist painter, uh, artist. He had sketcher, drawer, mm-hmm. and that he... Uh, was it had been an advertising artist. Okay. And he uh, could draw your face and, or paint your face photo real. Mm. And he chose to use these simplicities based off of a, a massive skill set in terms of his training to, he could paint something to look like a photograph. And, but he chose to use these massive, simple cartoon images that you could completely understand. And if you look at Van Gogh, you can instantly understand the image that takes up the entirety of the canvas, a bedroom, a starry night, a bull, a pair of boots, a man with a cob pipe. You understand what the image is before you have a chance to think. And that's what brings you into the very stunning, complex um, style or technique of Van Gogh, which couldn't be more different than Warhol. Mm. But what they both had in common is they use blocks. And I think on some level, they were probably both aware of it. Jamie, uh, I want to get into some marketing ex- examples of blocks in marketing. Before we do that, just talk about how important size and repetition is when creating a block. Well, there's a brilliant, I mean, it sounds like you have amazing people on this podcast. I like what you said about Seth Godin earlier. Like, what, you know, he's so wise when he talks about you just need to create your own tribe, right? And then that's enough. And it really, it really is. And, Another great idea and great book that came out in the last, you know, 10 years was Simon Sinek's Start With Why. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. I would go on to say they buy why you do it or the result you achieve. What I would argue is if you figure out this why that your customers can uh, emotionally connect to, but if you don't communicate it in an oversized way, like a road sign or a warning label, which is very similar to the, a soup can or a Van Gogh in terms of the instant understandability and, it, and the negative space around, like just the instant, there's nothing else there because it takes up the entirety of the image. If you don't make it oversized, no one will see your why and no one will connect with you. So it's not just enough to come up with something that your customers can connect to without thinking. It has to be oversized like Sesame Street. What I argue that as we get above elementary teaching or learning, we stop communicating to each other in elementary ways. And that adults crave this elementary communication even more than kids do. And it's almost an oasis, this elementary way of communicating in a world where being people are being some, so bombarded. Adults crave it more and they're starving for it. So do you literally mean that for, like, let's talk about marketing communications, but everything should be oversized. We need big headlines and big images. And uh, am I being too literal? No, you're not. I mean, that, you know, and I'm so literal with that in the book. I don't think I could be more literal with that in the book. And people still don't get it uh, because it makes people feel uncomfortable. If you make something oversized, everybody looks at it and people think they want to stand out. But really, you know, if you're, I go on stage a lot for a living and, and, uh, no matter how much I do it, when everybody's staring at me, it gives me just, it gives me a little bit of anxiety. So mm-hmm. yeah, it couldn't be more literal. I repeat it ad nauseum in the book, and still people don't understand how important it needs to be. It is to be oversized, and I really appreciate you saying that because this is the first interview where anybody's ever asked me about that or zoomed in on that. You did you ad nauseum in the book. You keep coming back to it. I mean, even the cover of your book, the iconist. I mean, everything's big, you know, on it. Yeah, repetition is also important, right? Is in terms of because again, what you mean by repetition is you know identify your blocks and then repeat them ad nauseum in all the different mediums that you're in, whether it be online or packaging or advertising or or what whatever it may be. And, you know, that's repetition is something that we learned in advertising uh, many years ago. And you think about uh, TV ads, which is, you know, something we don't see a lot of these days if you don't watch a lot of TV, but you see them often. And that's why it takes a message a number of times to sink in. But between the importance of size and repetition, 
that's a two good ingredients to creating a great block, right? Are we having the marketing part of this conversation now a little bit? Let's go. Let's go. Getting examples of great blocks. One example that I give from the book that is my favorite example, but I'll give more than this one if you want. Mm-hmm. And that, that I, uh, I don't think I've talked about it in an interview before. This example of this family in the 1930s, this man, uh, Ted Hughes, said he got a small inheritance and he finished pharmacy school, $3,000, which would have been a fortune back then. And he wanted to go move to a quiet place to raise his kids and a place where uh, he could afford to open his own pharmacy. And he picked a tiny town in North Dakota or South Dakota to open this pharmacy. And he quickly realized that despite the investment, they were in a small town off of an interstate and no one was coming into his pharmacy in the middle of nowhere, the only place he could afford to open it, even though there was a major through interstate that went a uh, freeway or interstate that went, what do you call them in Australia? That's fine. Freeway. Okay, fine. okay. Freeway. They went right by the town. So they were really frustrated and nervous. Uh, this is right after this is the Great Depression had started in the 1930s. Well, one day his wife, Dorothy, got this idea to what do people that are driving down that interstate need? They were tired and it was hot out there in the middle of nowhere and thirsty. So she, the, his wife got this idea to put up a massive billboard on the interstate saying free ice water. And they put up this sign in the 1930s during the depression. And before they could even get back, after putting the sign up, before they could even get back to the pharmacy, it was overrun with people. So there's an intersect point between something that you have to offer that may not even be the best of you or what you thought you wanted to sell, but there's an intersect point that it, that is the best of what you have to offer that intersects with what your customer most needs or that pr- your audience most needs at that particular time. And if you can find that intersect point and make a giant ice water sign out of it and communicate it huge Sesame Street style, you have Sesame Street in Australia, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, or like a giant warning label, oversized, uncomfortably large, it will mesmerize and lock in the attention of the people you're trying to reach. Hmm. And today, Wall Drug is a tourist destination. It's a massive multi-million dollar business. I interviewed the, the grandson and the great granddaughter who, gave, who very kindly gave me permission to use uh, some family photos uh, in the book, uh, in the book. Mm-hmm. but that, nice. but now it's massive and, and uh, millions of people stop by there every year because it's become a landmark uh, in I love this. another great example you give, Jamie, of Intel. Now, Intel's not a small business, but I think this is a very, really relevant um, example to everyone listening. So, they Intel released a new chip called the V Pro, and um, I'm not big on uh, Intel chips, but what I understand is there was lots of things Intel could have said about this chip. It's really small. It's really fast. It's this. It's that. But there was one, and they were going out with all these messages and confusing everyone and diluting, you know, what they had to offer. From what I can tell in the example you gave in the book, someone at Intel then said, hey, listen, let's just focus on one message, the one message that's going to really hit our prospects between the eyes. And that was, I think they came up with the line, leading edge security for an unwired workplace. And that became their block. They published it everywhere. It was a big headline. It was this and that. And that led people into then the intricacies of this chip. So I guess the learning there for everyone is like, in order to identify the block in your business that's going to seek it, that's going to get attention is get rid of all the clutter, all those things that you're trying to say to people and identify that one key insight that's going to have your prospects and your buyers sit up and pay attention. Okay. So, you know, that leading edge security for an unwired world thing, this is what's so interesting about a block. That may mean, that may not instantly mean much to a lot of your listeners. That is targeted at large corporations that are handing out 2,000 laptops to their employees Mm -hmm. that may have high levels of security. And what was happening with with Intel was, this is over 10 years ago, and they were starting to, their price was starting to be depressed because there were all these other chip guys like AMD coming into the market that were really good chips pushing the price down. So Intel created this chip to have something that their competitors didn't have that would allow 
IT departments in corporations to do remarkable things with thousands of remote laptops. They could do, and this is what they were over promoting. They could do updates on internal company software instantly with all their employees yep. with their laptops. This is one of the amazing things that this chip could do, but nobody was turning the chip on, even though they were putting it for free in all these computers. So it wasn't giving them an edge because only like 1% or 2% of their customers were using it. So they knew that it wasn't giving them an edge, all this innovation. So the other thing that it could do outside of this remote updates, which is remarkable for an IT guy, but the thing that it could do that was magic was if a laptop was stolen or 20 laptops or 100 laptops were stolen because corporations have a problem with intellectual content, proprietary content, they could remote wipe any laptop anywhere at any time. So in an unwired world with thousands of employees, that is a security feature that makes a company's skin hot. So even though that unwired leading edge security in an unwired world doesn't mean much to maybe some of your customers, to the IT professionals that are, or the security people in these companies that are responsible for the security of their information, that is a gut punch. But to that group of people responsible for corporate security, it is it is arresting. You're finding that message that hits people between the eyes. You're listening to the award-winning small business big marketing show, and we're chatting with Jamie Mustard, who's the author of The Iconist, a book all about standing out in this over-messaged world that we live in. Jamie, just to finish up, I'd like to talk about the process of helping my listeners starting to use blocks in their businesses in order to get noticed. So could you just sort of share the basic principles for using blocks, creating blocks, no matter what industry or niche they're in and how they can use the laws of attention to be heard and seen and remembered? Well, one example, one example I give in the book I'll do uh, is FedEx in the 1970s. They create, you know, there's a lot of confusion between a block and a tagline or a slogan. Yes. A tagline or a slogan is a desk. We know we need to lead with something simple. So it's a desperate, horrible thing that we try to create to grab, to be simple. And we end up being salesy and repelling people. Okay. A block is something that like is arresting to the, your, the particular audience when you put it in front of them. So FedEx in the 1970s, before fax machines, before the internet came up with this term, when it positively absolutely has to be there overnight. Now, if you had to get a form in for a divorce or a inheritance or a legal form for a lawsuit, that was an undeniable arresting statement. Okay. That's a block, a wholesome hostess or have a Coke and a smile or we're loving it. That's a slogan. It doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. It has to have an emotional electrification for your, the customer uh, in terms of the, uh, them needing it. So FedEx said that everywhere. They said it huge. And every customer, every business has something like that. So say you want to get buy-in from your boss about something. Well, what do they care about in relation to what you're pitching them? Well, say that in all caps at the top of your email, whether it's your boss or a colleague, and then repeat it twice a paragraph. This is the reason we're doing this. This is the reason we're doing this. This is the reason we're doing this. And it anchors your boss to a purpose that they care about. And it quickly makes that thing that they care about iconic in their mind in relation to your ideas. Mm -hmm. And you can apply it to anything. And one of the things that people often ask me at the end of things like this is, well, what if everybody does it? There's a chapter in the book called Road Signs. And road signs operate off the same principle as a Van Gogh, instantly understandable, or a Warhol. Mm -hmm. um, or a warning label magnifies your attention instantly because it's big, it's oversized, and there's nothing else around it. And there's billions of them. And so when it comes to life and death, we always use blocks. So we use billions of road signs and warning labels to save lives, and they always work. Anything that is uncomfortably large, that corresponds to the emotional concerns of your customers, that is based off of some transparent truth that you can deliver, will magnetize them. Got it. Well, Jamie, as I said at the start, it's a simple concept that does require some explanation. Hopefully, we've gone a fair way into helping listeners understand the concept 
of creating blocks in their business, which will, if they do it properly, result in iconic messaging. And that's what we all want. And if people want to take this a step further, I would encourage them to go and buy this book that you've written. It's called The Iconist. I had a good read of it over the past week. And and really enjoyed it. And lots of case studies and little examples and stories of of businesses and artists and musicians and speech makers that have used blocks to get noticed. And it can be found at theiconist.org. Jamie, great, mate. Well done on writing a book. I've written one myself. It's not easy. And uh, may you create a movement in the uh, these blocks that you have now. Thank you so much, Tim. You have an amazing mind when I was reading about all the stuff that you do and your Thank ideas. You. So, to have somebody like you get it, uh, it really means a lot to me. My pleasure, mate. Well, uh, from one author to another, well done, Jamie Mustard. Thank you. Well, there you go. Author of The Iconist, Jamie Mustard. Now, Jamie has kindly given me 20 copies of his bestseller to give to future Monster Prize Draw winners, so be sure to get your entries in. But right now, here's what grabbed my attention from that chat with Jamie. Attention grabber number one. I love the fact that Jamie reminded us just how crowded a marketplace we all operate in. Do yourself a favour and spend some time reflecting on this. It's scary, but it's critical as it'll motivate you to spend more time crafting marketing messages that cut through the clutter. You may well even create an icon. Attention grabber number two. I love Jamie's view on repetition. If you're one of those marketers who feels the need to constantly reinvent the wheel, then I'd encourage you to stop and instead focus on repeating those parts of your marketing that actually work. Now, that seems obvious, but sometimes I see business owners or marketing managers throw ideas out just because they want to bring in the next bright, shiny object, and that doesn't always bode well for that beautiful business of yours. An attention grabber number three. I love Jamie's reminder that choice is not necessarily a great thing to offer your customers. Seems counterintuitive, right? Often us consumers struggle with too much choice. So make it easy for us and make a few great offers and not multiple average ones. Well, that's what grabbed my attention. Whatever grabbed yours, be sure to block out some time and implement it. Well, it's at about this time that I would run the Monster Prize Draw jingle. But, can't do it. No entries. Email me, tim at timreed.com.au. Tell me what's working in your business, and you might win. Before we wrap things up, just a reminder that you'll find plenty more where this came from, plus my entire archive full of ideas to grow your business is over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you're getting value from listening, then don't keep it a secret. Be sure to let other business owners know about this podcast. Next time we catch up with Mario Hazanarcos, who's the co-founder of online banking concept called Spriggy. The teacher's kids, and I love this, to, to respect money. In just five years, he's already surpassed Commonwealth Bank's Dolomites brand. That's no mean feat, let me tell you. This podcast was presented by me, Timbo Reed, produced by Matt Dwyer. Until next week, thanks for tuning in. Now get out there and take action.